Welcome to the second video uh, and webinar on IP responses to COVID-19. Uh, welcome back to those of you who joined us last week uh, and welcome to those of you uh, who are attending for the first time the Queen Mary Intellectual Property Research Institute series. Um, today, the focus is going to be on innovation. Um, and we've got uh, four speakers uh, lined up for you today. Um, I'm going to be the moderator. Uh, my name's Duncan Matthews. I'm the director of the Queen Mary Intellectual Property Research Institute. Um, and our first speaker today is going to be Professor Gwilym Roberts, who's a visiting professor at Queen Mary, uh, and also the chair of Kilburn and Strode uh, Patent and Trademark Attorneys. Um, after that, I'm going to be introducing Francesca Mazzi, who's uh, an early stage researcher uh, at Queen Mary uh, and also affiliated with Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Um, our third speaker will be Dr. Rory Horner, who's a senior lecturer in globalization and political economy at the University of Manchester. And our final speaker today will be Dr. James Griffin, uh, also a, a um, affiliation with Queen Mary as a uh, senior visiting research fellow in the uh, QMIPR uh, Institute and an associate professor in law at the University of Exeter. Um, the format today is um, each of the speakers will, will talk for approximately 10 minutes. Um, if there are any uh, specific questions, I will um, pose them to uh, the speakers after their talks. Um, for those of you in the audience, if you would like to post questions, please use the chat facility um, which you'll see at the bottom of the screen. Um, I will gather those questions together. Um, if there are one or two questions for individual speakers, I'll ask them uh, after each talk. Um, and we'll then have approximately 20 minutes for Q&A discussion um, after the presentations. And we'll finish promptly at, at 1.15 British summer time. Um, so welcome to all of you from around the world. I know we've, we've got people online from Brazil uh, and India um, and uh, numerous other countries. So it's a very international audience. Uh, last week we had 165 participants. Uh, we're expecting a similar number of people online today. So welcome to you all. And without further ado, I will hand you over to our first speaker, uh, Professor Gwilym Roberts. Gwilym. Hi, and thank you very much, Duncan. Um, so hopefully you can see my first slide here. Um, that's the plan anyway. And um, I'm gonna be talking today about uh, the, uh, some of the history that we see about uh, innovation during crisis. Because I think to look forward and to see where we're going now, it's useful to look back and to see what's happened before. Um, and in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, patenting activity as an indicator of innovation. We know that they're not, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but it's a pretty strong relationship. And uh, I've created uh, and obtained quite a lot of data for this, and I need to put a quick thank you in here to RWS, a great searching firm, and um, my good friend uh, and conspirator, Costas Stefanides, who is brilliant at this kind of thing. So that's the, the data that we've got. We'll, we'll have a quick look at that data, uh, maybe a couple of innovation stories that we see coming from the, the, the historical data, and then perhaps quickly extrapolate forwards. Um, this is actually part of a larger uh, piece of work I've been doing, and there's a link there, um, which hopefully appears on slides of the being circulated, but basically if you go to that website, you'll find it. Uh, it's been fascinating uh, to actually do this. And, and uh, quick spoiler alert, very reassuring as well, that from what one can see, um, crises do stimulate uh, innovation uh, and um, it's sometimes in slightly surprising ways, as we'll see. So we'll start with a nice simple graph. Um, now this data is, has to be taken with a little bit of um, a, a, a caution, simply because patent data back to the 1930s is um, a little more sketchy and in particular until the 70s and 80s even it principally was uh, European and US data so the numbers increasing towards the, the top end on the right there may part be partly from that but as we can see a nice simple story um, the blue line is applications and we've seen a huge uh, and pretty exponential um, growth uh, in applications 
um, from the very beginning. Um, and of course, grants tr always trailed a little bit, partly because applications get abandoned and partly because of the time lag. But we can see again a similar growth and we can see little kinks and bumps there. And some of those are very interesting indeed. Uh, and we'll have a look at a couple of the details uh, in the next slide. So the three crises we particularly looked at historically um, started with World War II, and obviously that was one of the biggest upheavals the world's seen in the modern era. Um, and the, the data was, uh, is pretty clear here. We can see filings from the US, from Germany, and from GB um, over the patch 25 to 60. We can see a general growth. We can see a not surprising dip uh, from 39 to, well, just after 45, actually. Um, see a couple of interesting things that come out of this. First of all, the key thing that seems to happen every time is that during crises, we see a leveling or dip, but not a huge drop uh, in uh, IP activity. Um, that very much uh, shows here. But a couple of other things you can pick out, the first of which is if you look at the red trace, which is Germany, then we see a massive increase after the Second World War, and that would be very that would tie into a huge area of rebuilding and, and growth. But everybody was pretty busy as well. Um, a more chilling indication is the only thing that seems to really stop innovation. You can see it in 1945, 46, and 47 is it's the destruction of infrastructure, I'm afraid, that, that stops innovation altogether, or at least patenting. And that, that's a very sobering figure there. Interestingly, there's also one in 1930, and I think that might be following on from the Great Depression, because Germany obviously suffered quite significantly there as well. But the growth afterwards is, is notable. Um, the second crisis that we looked at uh, was the, the oil crisis um, of the, the 70s. Um, and what actually going back to the, uh, the global patent trends, you can actually see around um, the 70s there of, of significant flattening of filings. Um, and in fact, we, we drilled in a bit further, but not on these slides, and you could see a, a, a leveling. I think around 73, and was when the, the Middle East basically banged up all the oil prices and the rest of the world panicked a bit. But then if we look at what are the stories about innovation that came out of it, we see a, a massive increase in the same period about renewable energy filings. Um, we see a second peak um, around the late 80s, which will have been oddly enough around Chernobyl, possibly, we're not sure. Um, but the, the story there is that not surprisingly, what happens when you see a crisis is that people start trying to innovate their way out of it. And here, not surprisingly, um, the renewable energy area was a, a, an area of great growth. Interestingly, at the beginning, uh, it probably wasn't called that. It was more, what can we do if you can't get oil? But it's fed rather nicely into the new concept of we don't really want oil. So that's been nice to see. The third crisis that we looked at uh, in some detail was the, the great uh, recession, um, as they call it, from 2007-2008. Um, and you can see a dip here specifically in filings in relation to finance, commerce, and crypto, crypto uh, patent filings, uh, blockchain, that kind of thing later on. Um, and again, we see that dip, but we see the increase afterwards. So from all of these, what we basically pick up is that, again, whilst, whilst crises do potentially slow down innovation in the immediate term, they tend to boost it going forwards. So we had a quick look at the sort of types of innovation that we can derive coming out of uh, these crises. Um, and we saw some interesting patterns. It's all very difficult to draw um, uh, incredibly detailed um, um, conclusions. However, we saw four particular um, activities. And probably World War II is a good example for this. So first of all, we saw crisis as an innovation accelerator. And by that, I mean that new technologies weren't being created from scratch. What was happening was that technologies were in place and nobody had really worked out what to do with them. And a fantastic example of that uh, is radar. Uh, before World War II, the technology had been developed in the 30s, but there were all kinds of issues around scalability and distance and so on, which was solved in incredibly short order um, in, a, in the late 30s, early 40s, um, in, in particular by the use of magnetrons to create the radiation you needed to bounce off things. So what happened was the technology was accelerated enormously, and there were other examples of that. The second is collaboration driver. So what we also saw in that and many subsequent crises is either um, 
uh, industry collaborating or government and industry collaborations taking off at a huge rate. Uh, an example is the petrochemical industry during World War II. Uh, rubber supplies were basically cut off from Asia, and so there was a massive push. Uh, and we saw huge uh, patent pooling exercises in the US. Uh, the US actually had to rewrite its patent law after the Second World War to take into account the amount of public funding that was also going into patenting activity. We've seen crisis uh, and consequence, so what comes out of crisis afterwards? And a lovely example of that uh, is, is radar again, where in fact that continued and uh, they discovered in I think the 50s or 60s that radar actually, um, mag magnetrons used in radars, that they were researching and were heating up the research sandwiches uh, out of which came the microwave oven. So everybody's got a magnetron in their house now. Um, we saw huge movement obviously in computing coming out of the code breaking uh, in nuclear technology, uh, in jet technology and so on as well. Um, all from the, the basic work that was done during the war and of course we see serendipity so occasionally surprising inventions come out I think my favourite one is the slinky spring, that thing that walks down your stairs actually was originally for stabilising uh, naval um, um, navigation devices and then somebody basically dropped it down the stairs and started selling it as a toy, which is a fun story. Um, so what can we extrapolate for the present situation? Well, I think we can extrapolate that we're going to see growth once again, um, that a patenting activity is going to, going, going to stay healthy and innovation is going to take off. And we're already seeing in the, the patent sphere that activity is definitely not dropping according to kind of up-to-date uh, reports from the various patent offices. Um, but where might we see growth? Well, there's some obvious ones in relation to um, the health side of things, and we know already there's huge amounts of collaboration, so we're seeing that activity. We can see, uh, we can expect some acceleration of existing technologies, and for me, I think actually the, the video conferencing, the fact we're all on Zoom, which nobody had heard of four months ago, is a good example of that. We can see huge growth there and many other areas too. And we are going to have to keep an eye on public policy, and I think this might come up in, in later talks today, but um, we need to be aware that uh, we need to use IP wisely at this time. Interestingly, this isn't the first time this has come up. Um, I think if you look at the provisions in various patents acts, it's already well known um, that IP has to be thought of very carefully from a policy perspective during crises. The policy shifts slightly from the long-term incentive to innovate uh, and get reward to a short-term incentive to work for the common good um, and those two mesh together very nicely but we do need to make sure that that happens. Um, I'm conscious of time so that is um, principally the points I wanted to, to cover off. Um, there's plenty more on the website and of course I'd be interested to see any questions but uh, Duncan I'm going to stop sharing now hopefully and pass back to you. Thank you, Gwilym. That was fantastic. Um, let's turn my camera back on. Great, that was fantastic. Um, perfectly to time. And uh, Gwilym, before I move on to our next speaker, uh, we did have one, one question which uh, now might be a good time for you to address. The question came from Christopher Strothers, uh, who asked, to what extent does troll filing follow these same patterns? e.g. non-practicing entities spot the innovation trends and start filing in these areas in order to capture the royalties in due course? Well, we haven't researched that. However, uh, with a, there's already evidence uh, that there was tr early troll activity during this crisis. Uh, I won't name names because I'm not too sure why well, I don't want to, but there was certainly a pharma company who quickly recognized that some of their IP uh, was potentially being infringed by people developing tests and vaccines, etc., and went after people. Uh, they hadn't really read the room, Duncan, uh, and they, they stepped back very quickly and have shifted instead to royalty-free licensing. So at the moment, the mood of collaboration is strong, and I think anybody who um, tries to do early work like that is going to get a, a, a bit of a pasting from public opinion and, and, and probably won't. However, it's a very, very strong question. And I'm, I'm afraid I'm sure that there will be people working on that. Um, troll is a tricky term. Uh, there are many ent entities who would say, no, we develop stuff. We just enforce our IP. But clearly, we know that trolling can happen at fairly strong levels. It's a very interesting question. I think we might do some work on that. Thank you very much, Christopher. Um, uh, I'd like to say um, that the world's too nice for that, but we know it isn't. Thanks, Gwilym. Um, 
We do have other questions coming in for you, but I'm going to keep those until the general Q&A at the end of uh, the webinar. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to introduce our second uh, speaker today. Uh, Francesca Mazzi is an uh, early career researcher in the Queen Mary Intellectual Property Research Institute, um, and she's also affiliated with Maastricht University uh, in the Netherlands. She's going to be talking about contact, contact tracing apps um, and implications for privacy. Francesca, thank you. Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, as Duncan mentioned, I'm going to talk about privacy and content, tra content tracing applications. Um, a little bit of uh, context, although I assume everyone is quite familiar with it. So COVID-19 disease uh, is a global health challenge. It was declared a global pandemic by the OMS. There are some issues that we want to bear in mind for this presentation. The first one is that the main problem is that the contagion rate, the timing of symptoms development and the asymptomatic cases are likely to overburden the healthcare structures. And uh, the fact that the contagion mainly happens with physical proximity between individuals. It, is, it can also happen uh, by other means, such as surfaces, but these are still data that uh, are under research and study. Uh, so there is a global effort against the pandemic at the moment, and the goal is to keep the contagion rate under control. Um, we witnessed uh, some initial measures such as lockdown, quarantine and the physical tracing of positives by national health authorities. And at the moment we are seeing gradual reopenings in countries that manage to keep the contagion rate under control and uh, the development of these contact tracing applications. So contact tracing applications are mainly aimed at tracing the spread of the disease to contain it. Uh, how do they work? Basically, they send an alarm uh, to people that might have been in contact with an infected individual. Uh, this tracing activity, as I mentioned before, was already done by national health authorities without the help of uh, an application at the beginning of the pandemic. So, for example, in Italy, it happened that you were at a conference and maybe one person attending the conference found out he was healed and then national health authorities would contact all the people that were at the conference to ask them to monitor their health situation. So now the privacy with the, the, the problem uh, with the contact tracing applications is privacy. Uh, why that? Um, so first of all, uh, there is a big question at the beginning. So shall we uh, give up our privacy for public health reason? And second of all, if we are to use um, um, our technology, uh, is there a technology that allow, allows us to maintain a certain degree of privacy? Um, so there are different interests at stake. And what is the challenge uh, now? The challenge is how to strike a balance between the interests. So you have a picture of the Spanish flu, uh, and then you have a picture of the George Orwell 1984, the Surveillance Society. Um, uh, I've participated to a study that analyzed uh, 18 um, contact tracing apps together with health economics professors and IT um, professors in order to evaluate to what extent the existing apps are um, striking uh, this balance. Uh, so we did a literature review of databases and we selected some applications, including those that uh, were not um, uh, developed in Europe, so worldwide applications. And we researched some of the features um, based, based on the available portals, both by the governments and uh, by the developers' websites. And we evaluated the features um, based on legal uh, instruments. So we selected European legal instruments. We selected, first of all, the GDPR. The GDPR at Article 9.2 allows uh, the processing of certain categories of data that in principle should be prohibited in case of public interest and specifically in the area of public health when there is a cross-border threats to health, for example. Um, so, but uh, the fact that there is Article 9.2, uh, uh, it's already something that tells us that the GDPR has uh, in itself 
the regulation of this hypothesis of this scenario. So it's not not to be applicable. It is to be applicable. Um, uh, the privacy code of conduct of mobile health apps of the European Commission was another instrument that we used and the guidelines on the use of location data and contact tracing tools in the context of COVID-19 outbreak that was released by the European Data Protection Board. So we basically analyzed these uh, 18 uh, contact tracing applications. Uh, I cannot say exactly which ones because the, the paper is to be published soon. And uh, we uh, evaluate the compliance of these uh, applications with the, the selected legal instruments. And we also uh, um, try to interpret the law um, to evaluate the single technical features of the apps. So which, uh, what are the key uh, findings? First of all, there is a difference between those apps that are voluntary and mandatory. In the guidelines, it is specifically said that it's important to have uh, voluntary applications. Obviously, in other countries, it's not like that. Um, but there is also there are also other factors that uh, influence this, such as, uh, for example, in Asia, there is um, more uh, the people citizens are um, more used to have a higher degree of uh, uh, surveillance, or in general, the the for example, a temperature check before entering public places is something that happened already before COVID-19. But uh, in, uh, in Europe, based on the guidelines, we uh, um, promote to maintain this balance, uh, the voluntary uh, approach of the app uh, to avoid discrimination and also to avoid the uh, enforcement that would happen. Uh, another key element is um, the difference between centralized and decentralized model. So this concern data storage. Um, so centralized models store the data of the users at the, in a central database, whereas decentralized models, uh, they use um, systems that allows to store data on the user's devices. So basically, in case of a cyber attack, a centralized model has all the user's data together, whereas the centralized model uh, is easier, uh, it's, um, it's easier to protect because each cyber attack should uh, go against the single user's devices. So uh, the guidelines uh, allows both uh, approaches, but this is the centralized model seems to be the safest one. Another key element is the difference between GPS data and Bluetooth data, which we can say location and proximity data. Uh, so according to the guidelines, location data um, collected for, from the terminal equipment is regulated by the e-privacy directive. And the e-privacy uh, directive allows for the locations when they constitute a necessary, proportionate and, and appropriate measure within a democratic society. Um, so in this case, um, in the study, we asked ourselves, is that necessary to know where the contact happened on the, or the mere fact that the contact happened? And the answer is obviously the mere fact that the contact happened, um, especially since Bluetooth uh, data allows to uh, maintain a high, highest, higher level of privacy with changing ephemeral ident identifiers. And so, in uh, in our in our opinion, um, Bluetooth data is to be preferred, and it's also the um, the approach of uh, Google and Apple at the moment. Um, other key elements are data minimization, data retention, and the right not to be subject to automated decision making. Uh, what does it mean? So, data minimization. Uh, we analyze certain apps that co that collect not only these codes of the Bluetooth, but collects also uh, information from the credit card, from the travels, and this is against the principle of data minimization. So the, the application should just collect the necessary data for the purpose of tracing the spread of the disease. Uh, in terms of data retention, certain applications uh, don't say for how long data is going to be stored, um, whereas uh, it's supposed to have um, a limitation in terms of timing as well because it should be just proportionate uh, to the extent that is necessary to contain the spread of the disease. Uh, for what concerns the right not to be subject to automated decision making, the issue here is that um, in certain countries when you receive an alarm from the application, you are asked to be home, uh, to be self-quarantined, even though there is no person check checking the actual 
um, positivity of the test. Um, and this is against the right not to be subject to automated decision making. So this is not um, preferable in Europe. So the conclusion is that the preferable approach is a, a voluntary approach, decentralized, that uses Bluetooth and collect only proximity data. Uh, that is limited in terms of time and scope and that doesn't provide any obligation on individuals just from the mere use of the app. There are also other uh, considerations to do. So the efficacy of the contact tracing applications obviously depends on the percentage of the population that uses it, which means that if you want to use a voluntary uh, based uh, application, you have to work on uh, the trust, the level of trust between citizens and governments, which is something that uh, is quite important for the efficacy of the app. And also, as I said before, cultural difference also impact on the acceptance and use of the apps worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesca. That was uh, a very topical uh, issue, I think, for everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, keep any questions until the end of the session rather than deal with them now so that we have enough time for all our speakers. Um, and just a reminder to those of you in the audience, if you do want to ask questions, please use the uh, chat function at the bottom of the screen and I'll uh, pick those up and, and pose the questions to our panelists uh, later. Um, so before we, we have that Q&A section, I'm going to hand over now to our third speaker today. Thank you, Francesca. Our third speaker is uh, Rory Horner. Uh, Rory is from the University of Manchester. I think he's the, the only non-patent uh, specialist or lawyer on this panel today. Uh, Rory, I'll let you introduce yourself. But Rory's from Manchester University um, and recently wrote um, a really excellent article in the um, online magazine, The Conversation. Uh, in which he wrote about um, pharmaceutical supply chains. And because of that, I invited Rory to come and join us and, and talk about some of those issues today. Um, so Rory, over to you. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, it's great to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, a good evening to everybody, depending on, on what part of the world you're in. Uh, as Duncan said, I don't have a legal background, so the questions, uh, please uh, go easy on me from that point of view. I'm interested in, I'm gonna talk as my title here says about how the world needs pharmaceuticals from India and China to beat COVID-19. And I think particularly those who are in Europe and North America, we hear a lot in the media about, oh, the, the vaccine being developed at Oxford or different companies in America were in a race to discover the, the vaccine or, or different trials on different drugs that are being conducted in in the UK or elsewhere in Europe and America. But if we're not thinking just about finding a drug or a vaccine that works, but making sure a drug or a vaccine reaches most of the world's population who need it, then we need to be thinking about the role of China and India as key players in the COVID-19 response. Uh, just very briefly, uh, China plays a major role in the production of what are known as active pharmaceutical ingredients. These are the key uh, th these are the key ingredients which essentially make a therapeutic difference in the, bo in, in the body when you consume a drug. The finished drug, a formulation, can be in the form of a tablet, a liquid, a capsule. India has much greater specialization in the production of generic formulations and actually relies to a considerable extent on China for many of the ingredients for its drugs. About as uh, 70% of India's APIs come from China, a big uh, concern. On the other issue that's emerged from India and China in recent days with the, uh, the border tension, India is also a major producer of vaccines. And although just like pharmaceuticals, when we measure by revenue terms, the biggest vaccine companies, the biggest pharmaceutical companies are from Europe and North America, the biggest vaccine producer in the world is Serum Institute of India. And it's going to come in later in my COVID-19 story. Just very, very briefly, uh, India's pharmaceutical industry, IP has played a central role in the emergence of this industry. Uh, and this, but there's a broader point here about how manufacturing capabilities are important too. For a long time after its independence, India wanted to change its patent law, but the foreign multinationals still had significant control over the industry. And it was only really when significant domestic capabilities had been built through state-owned companies that India's patent law was changed in 1970 to remove product patents and 
and essentially be a key facilitator to the domestic industry. Other countries, though, at the same time, actually had relatively limited patent protection, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Egypt, but didn't develop domestic pharmaceutical industries to the same extent. And to me, one of the key differences here was the heavy restrictions on foreign investment and encouragement for foreign multinationals to also invest in local manufacturing. So there was a real push on pharmaceutical manufacturing capabilities as well as the patent provisions. India, to some, to some was, was seen as central to why we have a global patent law uh, our global patent provisions as part of the World Trade Organization and trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights agreement. This uh, quote I have uh, from the, the main uh, lobby or industrial group for Big Pharma uh, from 1999 is one example of that, but there's sort of widespread uh, evidence from looking in detail at the negotiations as Peter Drahaus, one of last week's panelists that outlined in, in detail in his book, Information Feudalism, India was a central motivation for putting in place global patent protection in these negotiations from the late 1980s onwards. Uh, of course, uh, India eventually resisted and, and, and we have the TRIPS as part of a condition of membership of the WTO today, but this in a sense put a lot of global attention on what could be done in India when you have less patent protection in pharmaceuticals, India became known as the pharmacy of the developing world and attracted huge attention in the context of manufacturing antiretrovirals for people living with HIV AIDS. And I'm gonna talk through now a number of examples of drugs and then vaccines for COVID-19, where all of them, India has been central so far. Uh, hydroxychloroquine, it's got a lot of attention. Donald Trump recently said he was taking it. In a sense, this was the first drug which attracted a lot of hype in the context of COVID-19 as a treatment. India produces a significant portion of the, the world's uh, hydroxychloroquine. IPCA is the major uh, producer, uh, 70 to 80% of the, of the market pre-COVID pre in India. Uh, India actually then put in place an export ban, which led to fears about different sort of trade, uh, how trade restrictions might be a barrier to access to medicines as well as, uh, in this case, this is a long-standing drug, so there was no IP issue, but there was a concern about trade. So India put in place a ban on the export of hydroxychloroquine. There was significant diplomatic pressure. Uh, Donald Trump threatened retaliation and eventually uh, India agreed under certain circumstances to still continue to export hydroxychloroquine. There's not as much hype about uh, that dr drug today. There's a lot of debates and question marks about how useful it is. I think it was only useful because there was, or, or got a lot of attention because there was, there was little else at that time. One of the later drugs, though, which has attracted a lot of attention, which Gilead has a patent for and is under patent protection, there's a, a significant IP component here, is remdesivir, an antiviral, sorry, an antiviral drug which had been approved for the treatment of Ebola. Uh, in the beginning of this year, Gilead wasn't actually, even though it had a patent for it, it wasn't actually producing this drug because there was essentially no real existing market for it. Uh, but very quickly, once COVID-19 broke out in China. It started trials in Wuhan in mid-February. By end of March, reports were saying a number of Chinese companies had capabilities to develop this drug. Uh, reports from mid-April in India saying Dr. Reddy's laboratories was producing and that a number of weeks earlier uh, or had started working on it. And a number of weeks earlier, Sipla had also begun working on the drug. And uh, this was despite uh, Gilead having a patent uh, for it mid late uh, May, Gilead announces a voluntary license uh, for 127 countries to initially five companies, subsequently expanded to nine companies, seven of which are in uh, India. And I think here there was no compulsory license issued, but the fact compulsory licenses are present, if any part of the world was to issue a compulsory license, the most likely first mover and given widespread awareness of what was happening in India, it would have been, uh, would have been uh, in India that a compulsory license would have been issued. So it wasn't made use of, but I think the fact it was there could have potentially played a key role in uh, Gilead making this move on voluntary licensing. A drug which has attracted a lot of attention, I think just as this equivalent panel uh, ended last week, we got a lot of media attention in the UK at least about this study out of Oxford on dexamethasone, which is a, a long-standing, again, off-patent a steroid, which has been used for a long period of time. Again, uh, India is a major producer of this. 
uh, producing 46% of the global volume. Uh, within India, Zytus Cadilla is, is the major producer of this drug uh, pre, pre-COVID. India, again, here relies on a lot of API from, uh, from, from China. So this is, a, this is a, a more recent drug. Just yesterday, Dr. Tedros, uh, uh, the head of the World Health Organization, argued that uh, companies around the world need to scale up their production of this drug. If anybody's going to scale it up, it's going to be India. Just briefly, uh, or that, that will lead the way, just very briefly to talk a little bit also about how China and India are actually central to what we're seeing on development of vaccines for COVID-19. Uh, this is a table uh, I put together just from, from yesterday, the World Health Organization released its latest update on the vaccine development landscape. There's 13 vaccines which are currently in uh, clinical trials. Uh, five of those vaccines are in uh, trials in China and have key, key roles played by, by Chinese research teams. Uh, the one which is in the most advanced stage of trials is uh, from Oxford University, but which, uh, which is now in stage three, but which uh, the global rights to the manufacturer, uh, the distribution and marketing of that drug have been given to AstraZeneca. Uh, there's What's particularly interesting here is in the first announcement that it was the rights were being given to AstraZeneca. Already the only other company that was mentioned anywhere in the press release as potentially playing a role in the manufacturing was Serum Institute of India, who I mentioned earlier is the world's leading producer of vaccines in terms of volume of uh, vaccines. And a later uh, press release confirmed that uh, Serum Institute is part of a major uh, uh, licensing agreement from AstraZeneca that Serum Institute, as the agreement is that Serum Institute will produce 400 million doses of the Oxford vaccine by the end of this year and, and more than a bit, 1 billion in total. Uh, and this is where this companies are really moving very quickly to scale up manufacturing capabilities. We still don't actually yet know, though, whether this vaccine will be an effective vaccine against COVID-19. It's been relatively successful so far in its trials, but there's already huge scaling up of manufacturing capabilities around the world, particularly involving India to, to, uh, to scale up this vaccine. So just, just to conclude, uh, uh, va- manufacturing capabilities matter hugely for access. I think even if we go back to that historic example of the making of India's pharmaceutical industry, if India didn't have those manufacturing capabilities, the relatively uh, freer or, or less restrictive patent law regime at that time wouldn't necessarily have facilitated the growth of a domestic industry without also having those manufacturing capabilities in place, in, in place to, to, to make use of that. We've seen various drugs have attracted attention so far. In some ways, each drug only has to be a little bit better than the previous one, and we're starting off from a very low bar in terms of a relatively desperate search for treatments in the time of a major crisis. Remdesivir is a major one where IP issues have come in in terms of drugs uh, so far, uh, but there's also a lot of IP issues related to uh, potential vaccines too, which a lot of scaling up is already taking place. One of the really fascinating things, but which we many of us are quite limited on though, is actually what the nature of all these deals are between some of the for example, Gilead and its different licensees, and who who is left out of some of those uh, agreements as well. But also that applies to the nature of the agreements between, for example, AstraZeneca and Serum Institute in terms of who is actually, where that vaccine is going to go and who's going to get access to it, because many of these, uh, there's still less public awareness on that. So I think that's something we need to pay attention to, as well as, of course, the IP issue, but as well, I, I'm particularly keen to highlight how China and India and their manufacturing capabilities are really central to this current crisis and potential solutions. So I'll uh, pass back to, to, to you then, Duncan, now, and happy to take any, uh, hopefully not too detailed legal questions in the Q&A. Thanks, Rory, that was great. Um, actually, I'm gonna ask you a question, so I hope it's uh, uh, not too tricky. Um, uh, we've had some discussions uh, offline uh, between us about um, the kind of the new trend towards onshoring, onshoring rather yeah. than having offshore manufacturing of 
uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, how, do you have an impression of how that might affect the kind of the dynamics of the supply chain um, to, following on from the comments that you've just made? Yeah, well, there's been, I think the two most prominent moves have been India has announced uh, various incentives for more greater support for active pharmaceutical ingredients since the crisis. Also, the United States put a huge investment into uh, Flau Corp uh, to, to produce more ingredients in, in Virginia, a very uh, new company which had, had barely even existed before. So Europe has talked a, b a bit at the European level about greater industrial sovereignty. There's huge issues for coordination. If it's a kind of European move or would it be at a national level and particularly given current political dynamics in Europe, I think it's, we've seen in other parts of the world, East Africa, where there's been a move for local pharmaceutical production, but it creates tensions as whose country is the local production actually taken place in. So I think there, there is, this crisis is, it has given more uh, prominence to, to moves towards greater onshoring of pharmaceuticals, at least in discourse. It's not just discourse though, there's those American and, and Indian examples I pointed to, but it, it's, not, it's not easy to do. And particularly, uh, I think India is probably the most likely country to be able to do it given its, its large market and its, its, its size, but it's still, uh, there's, there's huge environmental uh, impacts of API production too, which often don't get so much attention. So there, there is cost to that. Uh, but it's going to be a really interesting trend to see in pharmaceuticals how this how this evolves in the next few years. Okay, thanks, Rory. Uh, I can see a lot of questions coming in for you. So I'm, what I'm going to do is gather those up um, and um, put them to you during the Q and A session after our last speaker. Um, uh, so thanks again, Rory. I'll uh, now hand over to James Griffin. Um, James Griffin is um, a, a Senior Research Fellow at the Queen Mary Intellectual Property Research Institute, um, and also an Associate Professor in Law at Exeter University. And of all the panelists, he has the most books, I think, today. So, James, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, can everyone see the, well, Duncan, can you see the slide properly? Yes, I can. Yeah, splendid. Um, well, hello, everyone, and hello to those of you I recognize in the audience. So it's great to see you all there. Um, now, I will be jumping about between different programs as I'm speaking um, because I want to show you how some of the software works. I will therefore be having to share and not share the screen at different times in order to get this to work. Uh, as when we were trying this a little bit earlier, it was a bit problematic. Okay. So, anyway, the next 10 minutes are going to be about 3D printing and PPE. Uh, so, PPE stands for uh, personal. Um, what was it personal protection equipment or something along those lines? And I've, I've just forgotten. Um, anyway, you, you know. Um, and so there are various issues with 3D printing and PPE that I want to go into and discuss uh, today so that um, we can get a bit of appreciation for some of the issues that, that we have here. So I'll be looking at copyright first of all and spending most of the time on that. Uh, then a little bit of time on patents and then last of all tort in relation to some of the civil liability issues uh, that we have. Um, now if we begin with copyright, um, there are two main things here that we want to be thinking about. First of all, uh, some of the issues to do with the underlying technologies that cause various concerns in relation to who is the author um, of the work that we're looking at. And then some of the issues relating to the distribution um, of things like the files that we might use in the printing of uh, PPE. So the underlying technologies then, I'm going to look at an example um, of uh, this thing here called the Prusa uh, face shield. Um, and specifically, what we want to look at is this bit here. Um, so this bit is the 3D printed part of the face shield that is you know, typically shown. And uh, this, um, this particular part here, um, you can go onto the, the website and download it and print it um, through your 3D printer. Okay. Um, and so, this is the file that you would download, this one here. This is what you would download to your computer. 
Now, this may to you just look like a simple file and you'll just tell your computer to go and print it. But there's a lot more to this than that. And this is where we get some of the issues um, in this area. So we begin here with this software. Um, so this is the Blender software uh, that we can use uh, to uh, create files with. Okay, so I'm just gonna move over to that just to show you some of the issues um, here. Okay, so we'll just go into that. And so hopefully what you can see now is a pink monster. Duncan, can you see a pink monster? I can see a pink monster, yes. Actually, Duncan is hallucinating. <laughs> um, uh, so this is the sort of software that you might see used in Hollywood films and so on and such like. Um, now, obviously, that's why I'm showing this pink monster, just so you have the link. But it can also be used to create what you've just seen. Um, the piece of 3D printing here that you would use in the face mask. Now, first of all, this object itself, because of the type of software that we're using, it's made up of pr various primitive objects that you edit and shape and change. Those objects being made by other people. Now, that I think is unlikely to pose an authorship problem because of their basic nature, but you never know. Um, so that is the first thing that I would like to point out to you is that the creation of these things right at the very start, the very basic objects, themselves may potentially have competing copyright claims. But that is not all. Now, if I show you a different example um, of a face mask, so this one here, if I can get it to work, this one is designed to be able to fit individuals um, specifically, okay, so rather than a generic piece. So this has some software attached to it, so you could scan in someone's face and you can manipulate the shape to make it fit them correctly. Now, if you look um, on the screen on the right hand side, you'll see a little bit of text saying my face mask. Now, this part around here um, and some other parts on the screen, which you may or may not be able to see, is some software that you can load separately into this 3D program that will allow you to manipulate these shapes uh, more specifically. This potentially may pose copyright questions in terms of obviously the people who write the software, um, also whether they implant any potential digital rights management mechanisms within the print, um, and also more general issues of well, what happens if they withdraw um, the plug-in piece of software? What happens if this is something that say that becomes highly important for people uh, to use as PPE, you know, if hospitals are using this, what happens if suddenly the plugin is withdrawn and people can't change or use this stuff in the way that was originally intended? What, what can we do there with copyright? Um, so that's a question really that I, I just want to mention at this stage. So even the creation of these things can be a little bit tricky. Now, this is just the initial stage. So you would take this and you go to file and then I think export in this program and you would save this as an STL file. And then that allows you to transport this over to your 3D printing program. And this is where we get our next thing that we need to think about. So now we change over to our next program, this one. So there are many types of programs like these. Um, Duncan, can you see this? Yes, I can see that. Splendid. Um, so you would impart that file into this program to enable you to print it. Um, and here we get some more issues that we need to think about. Um, because in order to print this, we have to run some more software on it. In this instance, we've got something called Slicer. There's another one called ScheneForge, which I'll show in a moment. Um, and you have to run this software. And off it goes, you see at the bottom, it's preparing some text. And then you get this file. And this is what allows you to then be able to um, print the file. Oops, sorry, I knew this was going to misbehave. So these yellow lines that you can see, uh, or green lines, are all the movements of the printer head. And the filled in parts here are all the patterns and things that are created by the slicer software to enable this to print and stick together. In this particular instance, this will be printing with ABS. 
Um, that comes out a little bit like toothpaste, I suppose you might say, out of the 3D printer and is put down in layers where it sticks to one another as it cools down. Now, you can edit these internal um, aspects yourself using some inputs, um, slightly mathematical. You can change the way in which this thing is printed in order to change the structure and strength of it. Different types of software doing this sort of thing works in different ways. So this, I think, is the next authorship issue. Now, the ones I'm talking about, Slicer, Skinforge, they're open source software, but the people who manipulate this, which could be a 3D printing company, do they own authorship then of the way this is printed? Is that going to be something additional to the original say the face mask here is that going to be an additional copyright so this is another thing we need to think about and all this text here you know, all this stuff what's the copyright situation with that and then of course with the final 3d print the way the printer itself actually prints something um, that is another thing where you might get some more software doing bits and pieces so those are all the numerous issues that we have um, with uh, the um, with the issue of ownership, so all these aspects here. So with the STL file, the original file that they imported, which is this, with the G code, which is all this and this, and then finally with the way in which the object is structured. And here you are. See, that's the one we were just using. This is another piece of software. It's going forward. Okay. So these are all different ways. Uh, that we can have different potentially competing copyright claims in any given 3D printed object. So that can pose issues actually uh, with 3D printed things. In terms of the law, we would turn to these provisions here. So 9, 10, 10A and 11 of the CDPA. There's nothing really specific with this that we need to go into detail with. It's different to other areas. Joint authorship is the main part that we'd be looking at, which is where you can't uh, separate out the distinct elements. That might be what we'd have um, here, but it probably depends on a case by case basis. The next significant copyright issue that we have is this. It's in relation to distribution. So the various ways uh, in which 3D printed files can be distributed could pose um, copyright issues. Um, now, with the face mask that I was just showing you, I picked that one up specifically as an example to give you because there was an issue with it in terms of the distribution. If you were listening carefully, the company who created it was Prusa, um, and they shared this thing for free on their website. That's what I showed you a picture of. What happened? Well, people started selling it, as you'll see on this report here, on eBay. It was as little as $3 and as much as 17 so people were making money from this, from the print of it. And Prusa was, of course, not terribly happy to see this going on. Now, of course, um, they could use copyright law to stop this. And you might think, well, what's the, going to be the issue there? Well, I direct you back to the previous discussion that I was just telling you, you know, that we have many different competing claims. And so maybe another um, party with a competing copyright claim in addition to Prusa, maybe could come along um, and seek to enforce copyright when Prusa itself wouldn't. You know, and we've got lots of issues like this. So the fact that we have a number of different authorship components in any 3D print is something, um, you know, that, that's an issue we need to think about, I think. Um, so that's the legal aspect in terms of the technology as well, which is something else we could think about. We can use digital rights management or track and trace mechanisms uh, to see how people are copying these things. So you could imagine that this part here is the surface of a 3D print. Maybe this is on the face mask. We can put a watermark into this so we can see how people are using the technology. This can be done on an individual basis. So every single 3D print could have a different watermark. This can be put on the surface of the thing or it could be put inside the file. Now, this is important because the way this works, this technology works, is that somebody could potentially take a photograph of somebody wearing, say, like this facial, this PPE, 
um, and be able to directly follow their movements or sign using the individualized watermark. So there are privacy concerns like we were just hearing earlier um, from Francesco in relation to this area. So this is another quite an interesting area of technology, um, but you know, it's, uh, it's got its issues too. So that's the main copyright concerns, I would say. What's the next main issue we could think about? And I shall speed up a little bit now. Patents. Now, I say this is a big but slightly unknown issue. Um, now, generally speaking with 3D printing, we've said that patents have a bearing upon the development of, say, open source 3D printing. Um, in that when patents expire in this area, that's when you people try and say that there's slightly more innovation occurring because people can reuse that which has been patented before and therefore um, experiment with 3D printing in new and novel ways. Now, you know, this is more of a general scope of patent discussion really, um, but in relation to PPE, um, there has been the use of patents in order to try and claim government funding. So this one, yeah, this company, Photocentric, um, basically utilized the patent that had been granted over the curing process, which is this, uh, in order to obtain um, government funding. As you can see, it got a lot of money um, for it. Now, this is the use of a patent to help make 3D printed things basically work better in the PPE environment. Now, you might want to do that because as this article highlights, um, unless you use the right curing processes and so on with 3D printing, um, you can have issues uh, with some of these prints. So if I was to print that face mask that I showed you earlier in my 3D printer, if you got any medicinal alcohol on it or anything like that, um, it would basically melt the plastic and you'd have uh, grey plasticky goo all over your face um, quite easily. So that's obviously not ideal. Um, the curing process helps deal with that. But you know, as we've just shown you, um, there is a patent over some of that. And while some of these patents are going to interfere uh, with the open source printing aspect of uh, PPE. It's too early to say, I think, but it's something that's obviously potentially an issue. Last of all, just to finish off, tort issues, so civil wrongs. We've got issues here. If we've got a number of different authors of a particular 3D printed object, who's going to be liable if something goes wrong? We've also got global issues here in terms of jurisdictions. We've also got issues with quality control. So you can actually use some of the digital rights management watermarking to assist with this, but you need copyright. And copyright isn't necessarily always the most appropriate thing in this area really, uh, because obviously not all PPE is gonna be something that would always be getting copyright, sometimes but not always. Um, so, some of these benefits of a watermark to help ensure the quality of a print or the quality of materials, you might not get legal protection over. We turn to that section there uh, to see the specific legal protections if you're interested. So what is the future for 3D printing in this area, 3D PPE? Um, it's difficult to say really in terms of the interface with IP. Um, I think a lot will depend upon what's happening with COVID-19 more generally. Um, but I think as well, you know, maybe the focus of this presentation is a bit narrow because it's just on PPE, but I do foresee 3DP becoming more and more important in terms of general fights with COVID-19, in terms of the equipment used uh, other than PPE. Um, so for instance, in uh, ventilators, it's been used there, uh, but also in relation to 3D biotech printing and these sorts of things uh, where people are looking at editing DNA um, to fight COVID-19. Um, the 3DP technologies can come into play there. Okay, so I shall stop there. Um, thank you very much. Um, hopefully all those, uh, all that jumping about between the different software didn't cause problems like it did in our practice run. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, James. Thank that you all worked very smoothly um, and nice linkages with Francesca Matz's presentation earlier on, on data privacy, which I liked. So we've got a lot of questions for the, the panel. Um, certainly, uh, any of you feel free to jump in at any time. Um, perhaps if the panelists could turn their cameras on um, uh, and I'll 
start giving you the questions. Thanks, Gwilym. Um, so the first question which came, came through, Gwilym, this was for you, was from Daniel Astone, who, who says, Mr. Roberts explored innovation in, quantita in quantitative terms. Is there any info about qualitative impacts, i.e. in crisis, informing innovation prior priorities? Uh, do crises reshape the content of the innovation agenda? Um, well, it's a great question. Um, and I think the short answer is it would appear to be the case. <clears throat> um, it may not reduce other areas of innovation, but it certainly stimulates related related areas. So and World War II was a long time ago, but oddly enough, it's probably the most, uh, the, the, the crisis has the most in common with the current one because it is kind of, it's health threatening in a slightly different way, but a very significant way. Um, in those days, though, it was more about defense, but we saw a definite drive towards a whole bunch of defense related technologies, not just the obvious ones, but also uh, infrastructure stuff. Again, go back to petrochemicals. Uh, and that's a very good example as a result of that and the, the, that research that came out of that, the innovation agenda around petrochemicals increased incredibly huge amounts of growth of research in that area. Um, similarly, I think the one that we have one slide there, didn't we, for the oil crisis and renewable energy, again, it was immediately pushed forward by it. Um, less obvious what came out of the financial crisis, but I think that may be because many of the solutions were economic or uh, mathematical, if you will, and less susceptible to patenting. Um, but it seems very likely that by the same token, we'll see a similar growth uh, of innovation in areas that are very relevant here, the whole medical areas that we've been talking about, uh, into, into connectivity, uh, the, 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 the new data revolution that we're all part of, for example. So in the short answer is yes, I'll post the link on the chat to the articles because there's, uh, there's lots more than I can get into 10 minutes. Yeah, okay, and just a quick follow-up question, uh, Gwilym, uh, from uh, my colleague, uh, Guan Tang, who asks if, if, there, if there are any specific, she says, specific adjustments on patents and trademark applications during the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Sure, there's been, practic there have been practical changes that, that are probably aren't that relevant to this discussion around uh, extensions of deadlines, of re reductions of fees or delay of fee payments to permit users to continue to innovate and use the patent system uh, if they're facing financial or practical difficult difficulties. And that's been a pretty global response, which has been excellent. Um, in terms of the, the numbers, um, best we can see is that patent office productivity remains pretty constant. They've taken very um, comfortably to remote working, um, I think generally. Um, in terms of patenting activity, it's very difficult to get numbers because patent applications are hidden. But an uh, interesting uh, statistic from the UK is that uh, their activity feels similar. I think the EPO is saying the same kind of thing. Trademark filings in the UK have actually jumped and no one quite knows why yet. Thank you, interesting. Willem, we're going to move on now, um, but feel free to jump in during the discussion. Thank you. Um, our second panelist was Francesca Mazzi. Uh, and Francesca, um, we've had a, a question posted from Charlene, who asks, um, on privacy and contact tracing, are there any provisions around the storage of some of the data after the crisis? So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So basically, on the guidelines, um, there is actually um, a provision saying that the current health crisis should not be used uh, as a chance to establish dispro disproportionate data retention mandates. So in general, storage limitations should consider the needs of the medical relevance, uh, and this obviously includes epidemiology motivated considerations, and personal data should be kept only for the duration of COVID-19 crisis. So as a general rule, afterwards, all personal data should be erased or anonymized. Okay, thank you. That's, that's good clarification. Thank you, Francesca. Um, I'm going to move on now to, to Rory. Rory, we've had a few questions for you, as you've probably seen on the chat facility. I'm going to start with um, Ken Shadlin's question to you. Um, Ken asks, um, uh, a lot of hope seems to be pinned on monoclonal antibodies as treatments for COVID-19. Independently of any patent issues involved, can you say a bit about manufacturing capabilities in India for MABAs? 
Okay, thanks, Duncan. Yeah, I, I, I've, uh, I've got in touch with Ken already directly on this. I don't have a brilliant answer for this, apart from that, uh, like many other parts of pharma industry, this is this is uh, definitely something that there are manufacturing capabilities on in India, and many of the, the leading firms, which you usually expect, are are present in this area. But it's not something I have in depth knowledge of that particular segment, so I don't want to uh, take up too much more time rambling on about something I'm not uh, expert on. Okay, I've got a couple of other quick questions for you, Rory. Yeah. Um, my colleague Guan Tang asks, um, what does the industry think about the political diversity and tensions? Um, any impact on the manufacturing capacity in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think what's fascinating in the whole pharmaceutical and vaccine story at the moment is how we have this huge political tension in the world and this nationalism at a kind of and, and, and then at the same time, we have a lot of the collaborations that are going on between scientific teams and in different parts of the world, and also the huge interdependency in supply chains for pharmaceuticals. So, I mean, there's been a longstanding fear in America, oh, maybe in a public health crisis. I mean, what happens if China has such a major role in supply of our ingredients? What happens if China just takes all the ingredients for itself? But at the same time, China needs some of the drugs that American companies produce and these kind of interdependencies actually place, although some politicians talk a big game in terms of they're gonna provide all the drugs to their own countries, they, they end up actually these interdependencies place some limitations on that. In the UK, we've seen how uh, Matt Hancock has said that the, the Oxford vaccine will be provided to the UK first, but at the same time, we know that there's 400 million of these that are now being manufactured in India by the end of the year and a billion we don't know exactly what that's what we don't know exactly who those drugs are going to go to. The Indian government are talking to Serum Institute every single single day about the update on their vaccine. They're they're not going to give away that that uh, vaccine for free. So it, it, I think this we we don't exactly know how this plays out. But I think the the interdependency of the industries do actually constrain to some degree the 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 extent of nationalism that will be present. Although at the same time we we have to be wary of that. Yeah. I agree. There's there's a whole uh, other issue about lack of transparency that that, that needs to be um, uh, you know the focus of, of of attention further. Yeah, Rory, I'm I'm just going to ask you one more question. We've got quite a few. I'll ask you one more, and then um, we'll go on to James. And if the, if there's time, I'll, I'll come back to you with those other questions. Um, the question I was going to pose to you is from Wen Tang Cheng, who I believe is still at the Australian National University. Um, uh, and uh, Wen Teng Cheng asks, um, it seems that in addition to the patent issues, um, export controls are also measures that states can use in the crisis. Are there any previous evidences for this and how can the world respond uh, to it in terms of promoting equitable access? So it's about uh, um, export controls. Yeah, I mean, this is something that's been a major feature of the whole, co and this is not just for pharmaceuticals. I mean, we've seen this with uh, PPE as well. Um, I mean, partly what we're seeing in this crisis is an enormous increase in demand for certain products. Uh, I mean, as I said, the remdesivir wasn't being produced at the beginning of this year, and now suddenly everybody's talking about how to get, uh, six months later, everybody's talking about how to get remdesivir. Hydroxychloroquine, uh, dexamethasone had been produced in India, but they weren't really having a major market. So it's inevitable, even without export controls, that there is going to be a market shortage because you have such an enormous spike in demand. The same for PPE, the enormous increase in demand for PPE. Uh, and uh, there's, there's a lot of also potential to blame export controls, for example, in the US for why PPE wasn't available. I've been looking a bit at the PPE situation in that regard. The American government was promoting exports of PPE to China right in into the early stages of March and basically fell asleep in terms of preparing itself with its own with its own procurement. So I think there, there there's a lot of attention placed on export controls, but they may not actually be the reason always why there is shortages. And in some cases where export controls have been put in place including in India, they've actually had to be kind of somewhat scaled back pretty quickly as including companies with domestic exporting and domestic companies with exporting interests want to be able to follow through on the supply arrangements they have with companies elsewhere. 
and so are very reluctant for these uh, complete export controls to be put in place. So we can't ignore them, but I think also at some points in this crisis, uh, too much kind of uh, blame has been put on export controls as reasons for shortages. Okay, thanks Rory. Um, as I said, I do have other questions for you, but um, if we don't have time today, perhaps I can um, uh, send them to you and you could perhaps respond by email to, to people individually. Um, because I did want to leave time um, to address some questions to James also. Um, James, we, we had um, a comment first and, and a question from David uh, Alvarez, um, who says, James, a great topic. Um, would this push the idea of authorship away towards a non-author collective creation even further? And then uh, as a sort of second question, um, also, does AI play any role here in terms of creation? Yeah, well, it's an interesting, interesting one to ask that because, um, yeah, because we have so many authors involved in any given 3D print, potentially, um, I, I'm not sure it necessarily leads away to sort of non-author collective creation idea, but I think it would be more likely to lead towards some form of registration or something along these lines uh, as a way of being able to identify who has created files and who has claims over the files. A little bit like we have um, in things like Creative Commons where people can clearly say what you can or cannot do with a file but also at the same time effectively laying some claim over it. So I think that's probably where I would see this issue ultimately going. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of your second question, in terms of AI playing a role in terms of creation, um, it could do. Uh, and we have issues here really in terms of how we define AI. You know, that's really the issue here. Um, we certainly have computer software that can do quite a lot that can play a role in the creation of 3D printed files. Um, whether or not that's what you mean by AI, I'm not sure, but I, I think certainly in future, uh, is a potential issue, depending on how you define it. Hmm. Thank you, James. Uh, and, and another question coming in from uh, from Dane uh, Kadilo Chandler, um, who says, thanks for an interesting presenta presentation, James. I wonder what happens in terms of liability when manipulating or modifying the, f the, modifying the files for PPE. I'm actually going to share a screen here. Can you all see this? Yes. Yeah. So this is an interesting thing because the face shield, the face mask that I was showing you just now, the presser one, you'll see looking at this web page here, there are all sorts of variations that people have made to it. Um, as you were talking, I, I, I was looking at this one, the, the Katia face shield. Um, and, you know, what, what are the liability issues with this? Are all these individuals uploading these files that you can download and then print? where does the liability lie? It's a very good question. not really one to which we have um, any clear answer. Um, I probably people do not realize that they could potentially be liable for these um, uh, sorts of things. Um, second part of the question, you're talking about, uh, is this treated differently because this involves health? Um, well, only in the sense, I think, really, as far as if you're seeking to have medical certification, then there are issues. Um, if you look about online, um, there is discussion um, of how some of this PPE has been donated to the NHS uh, and then basically been refused and it's had to go off to other countries uh, because of you know, just differing standards, differing requirements. So it's been an issue in relation to that. I mean, obviously, it could be a tortious issue down the line for people putting this stuff up online. Um, but right now, the main issue seems to be primarily in relation to certification um, and getting that in relation to this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um. Okay, thank you, James. Um, if if there, I'm, I'm just reviewing the questions again, and I'm aware that a lot of these might take um, a, a, a bit of, bit of time for, for people to answer uh, and can perhaps be, be dealt with offline. James, if, if, you, if you could um, have a quick comment on a question that's coming from Danusha Mendes, which is about uh, watermarks. And, and uh, Danusha is asking, is it really possible 
to design um, CAD files in relation to um, watermarks? Yes, uh, with CAD files, it's actually easier uh, than 3D prints because the 3D printing technology with watermarks, some of it actually comes uh, from initial experiments with putting watermarks into CAD files. Um, so you can actually, it's actually easier um, to achieve because the 3D printing files are there, they look complex. They're actually very, very simple in terms of the data that you have. They're just X, Y, and Z points essentially. So it's quite difficult to hide information in that. Whereas a CAD file, actually, it could be easier to do. Okay. Th th thanks for the succinct um, answer, James. Um, I'm very aware of the time uh, and the fact that a number of, of people uh, have uh, other uh, appointments coming up. Um, so I did say that we would finish on time um, at 1.15 today, which, which I'm planning to do. Um, so apologize, I apologize to those of you whose questions we didn't get to, but as I said, that um, I've made a note of those and I'll ask the speakers to respond to you individually. Um, so first of all, I'd like to, to thank our speakers, um, uh, Gwilym, Francesca, Rory and James. Uh, excellent presentations and a really nice discussion as well. Um, and um, of course, there's, there's much more that, that we can say about IP responses to COVID-19. Um, we are planning further events in our Queen Mary Intellectual Property Research webinar series. Um, so watch this space. We'll be in touch with details of future events. Um, thanks again to all of you for, for logging in. We had a fantastic number of participants today um, and great discussion as well as uh, questions uh, using the chat facility. Um, I'll close the meeting now. Uh, wish you all um, a good rest of the day. Um, and we'll be in touch soon with our future events. Thank you.